Greetings. Today is the 18th Sunday after Trinity, 29th of September of 2024. The service was pre-recorded on Friday, the 27th. Participants include dramatist Dr. Alan Mosier with his electrifying presentation of chapters 8 and 9 of Revelation, the Mar children as acolytes, Olivia, Alexa, Elena, and Dylan Marr, video photographer Shane Donnelly, and myself. Thank you for joining us, and have a good day in the Lord. Happy New Year! What? Happy New Year! This Wednesday evening and continuing to Thursday, it is the Jewish New Year. And Jewish people, our friends all over the world, will be celebrating the beginning of a new year. Now, there's not going to be much celebration in Israel because the country is having a war. But this is in the Bible. This is the New Year's that Jesus would have celebrated, and it's called the Feast of Trumpets. And in every synagogue, they begin the service and they end the service with blowing on a shofar. And what a shofar is, it is a horn that is made from a goat or a ram horn. And there are different ways of learning how to play it. And also, the Jewish New Year begins a season that we call the High Holy Days. And for the next 10 days, they are called the Days of All, concluding with another big holiday called Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And this year is the year 5,700 
85. No, it's not 2024. The Bible has a different way of reckoning time than we do. There are different calendars in use all over the world. Islam has a calendar. Maybe you have heard of the Chinese calendar. All right, there's a Jewish calendar. And of course, our calendar, we call the Gregorian calendar, used in the Christian church, and of course, in the United States and in Europe. But this is a Jewish calendar. They don't have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. They have the first day, the second day, and the third day. They number the days. Now, why is it the year 5,785? According to the traditional understanding of the Bible, Adam and Eve were made 5,785 years ago. That is how long humans have been on the earth. Now, I know scientists, they differ with that, and they think that humans have been around for millions of years. But that is not what the Bible teaches. And But here, here's the discussion. Well, if we have only been around for under 6,000 years, where did all the people come from? All right, so here's something we're going to talk about. Adam and Eve had three sons by name. But the, the Bible says that they had many other sons and daughters. They did. They had triplets and they had twins, all right? And they gave birth to a big family. And also, Adam and Eve lived a long time. And their children lived a long time. And so... They created the human family, and they have a family tree. And, of course, we can go through the Bible, and it tells us who all these people were. And, of course, then the Bible says that there was a great flood, and that most people were killed except eight people aboard Noah's Ark. And then we start all over again. Well, then... How did we get to the place right now where we have 8 billion people? How did that happen? Well, you here's the arithmetic. Okay. Each one of us, this is, affects all of us. Each one of us have two parents. And our parents had parents. So we have four grandparents. Then our grandparents had parents who are our great-grandparents. There's eight of them. We go the next generation. There are 16 second great-grandparents. All right, so if we go 12 generations, it takes 4,100 people to give us life. All right, that's how many. Just for me, all my family tree, my ancestors, and remember, they have other family members who are marrying other family members. All right, so the human population takes off. And <clears throat> here is something for us to consider. The people who came before us, we don't even know their names. But how did we get here in the United States? Unless we are a Native American, all of us came to this country either because we wanted to or we were forced to. And people had to work hard. They had to struggle. And you know, very vital to many of them was their faith in God. And their faith in God is what helped them to make it. And, and life was not easy. It was very difficult. And they had so many things up against them. But they trusted in God and they, they hoped for the best. And they tried to make things work. And what we always must remember, that each generation is like a link on a chain. The present, the past, and the future. Those who have gone before us, the people who are unborn before us, and now we ourselves. And that we're all building. And the call is for us to make the world a better place for the people who will come after us. That, that is what God wants us to do. And that is why God has given us the Bible, to help teach us 
how he wants us to live. So we join with our Jewish friends around the world, and we wish them a happy Rosh Hashanah. And again, these are the holidays that Jesus and the apostles would celebrate. And according to Jewish tradition, that Adam and Eve were created 5,785 years ago. And we are their great, 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 great grandchildren. And you always begin the Jewish New Year by eating something sweet. As you see here, the pomegranates and the apples, and you dip it in honey. And last week I shared with you the seven species or the seven goodly foods of Deuteronomy 8, 8. And one of them, figs. What I'm giving you as your gift today, a box of fig newtons. They're good. Enjoy. Happy New Year. The Word of God is found in the book of Revelation, chapters 8 and 9, from the King James Version Bible, dramatically performed by Dr. Alan Mosier. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar, which is before the throne and the smoke of the incense, which came with the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings at an earthquake. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound. First angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of trees was burnt up, and all green grass was burnt up. And the second angel sounded, and as it were a great mountain, burning with fire, was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded. And there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood. The third part of the waters became wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. The fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit. And there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth. Neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, 
but that they should be tormented five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. But in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. One woe is past. And behold, there come two woes more hereafter. And the sixth angel sounded. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, Loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, and a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand, and I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. Out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three were the third part of men killed, by the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths, for their power is in their mouth. And in their tails, for their tails are like unto serpents, and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men, which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils, and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. This is the word of the Lord. For the wedding gift, a grandfather presented a South Dakota rancher and his bride a leather-bound family Bible as a gift. The grandson wrote a thank you note and stored the good book on a shelf in a hallway closet. Each time Granddad would see the couple, he inquired if the newlyweds liked their present. Once the rancher did an investigation and leafed through the book of books to discover that new $20 bills fell from its pages. At the beginning of each of the 66 books of the Bible, Granddad had tucked a $20 as an incentive to get the Mr. and Mrs. to read the Word of God. Greater than the $1,320 hidden in the pages of Holy Writ are its spiritual riches, a true treasure chest of inspiration, wisdom, guidance, conviction, and insight. The last book of the Bible is introduced with a promise. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Whether we hold a copy of the scriptures in our own hands and delve into the text of Revelation, or listen to it dramatically performed by Dr. Mosher, or give attention to its reading by the lector in this service, the guarantee is that the contents are a blessing to our souls. The description of cataclysms, destruction, and death in chapters 8 and 9 
may have jolted you out of your seat. Christ, the Lamb of God, open a scroll, and one at a time, its seven wax seals resulting in judgments to the earth. With the opening of the seventh seal, there was a half-hour span of silence in heaven, su suggesting a calm before the storm. Seven angels are caught up, each blasting on a trumpet, announcing disasters to be hurled on the planet. Two of the seven are usually understood to be Michael and Gabriel, mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. Tradition has identified the other five as Raphael, Uriel, Regal, Saragel, and Phanuel. Note all seven male angels end with El, which is Hebrew meaning God. These are seven angels of God stationed by the throne of the king of the universe. The unit records at the onset that all the prayers of the saints, the people of God, that's us, rise to the Lord like the billowing clouds of fragrant incense. And the 34 verses conclude that the surviving population refused to repent of their evil doing. What beneficial life applications can we derive from this fascinating yet frightful vision, a puzzling and scary imagery? Number one, our prayers do not fall on deaf ears, but are received by Christ as a perfumed note, a message with an attached scent. In this heavenly scene, an eighth angel is holding a golden censer, and the ascending smoke carries the prayers of believers below to the very presence of God. Scoffers and skeptics may sneer that prayer is wasted energy, and all of our words end up in a dead-letter office. Did you hear there is a dial for prayer for atheists? You call up, and it rings and rings and rings, but nobody answers. Prayer works. Pat Robertson 700 Club has a prayer ministry 24-7, 300 65 days a year. Are you aware that the Christian shrines in the Holy Land, Bethlehem, Nazareth, and Jerusalem, provide a service that one can email request and a candle is lighted with the monks attending to the need? Several times, Independent Methodist Church has been upheld at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, our Lord's Tomb, by friends of this ministry. The number one request of this congregation and pastor is for prayer. I am in line at a supermarket cash register and people walk over with a desire that I remember them in my supplications. The Dutch evangelist and rescuer of Jews from the Nazis, Corey ten Boon wrote, We never know how God will answer our prayers, but we can expect that he will get us involved in his plan for the answer. If we are true intercessors, we must be ready to take part in God's work on behalf of the people for whom we pray. Intercessory prayer has been defined as the love of neighbor on our knees. And when we pray for someone, we are investing our time, our energy, our thought, our concern, our faith, concentrated for them as a labor of love. Even the smallest prayer is never lost. It ascends heavenward like a cloud of incense, pleasing unto the Lord. I have never had any children, but I want parishioners to know that when I listen in on some of you praying publicly, maybe for the first time, I am like a daddy, enthralled by his child, speaking his first words. And God the Father welcomes hearing from us. 
and truer than true is the observation of William Cowper. Satan trembles when he sees the weakest Christian upon his knees. Number two, as the only prophetic book in the New Testament, Revelation has appealed to every generation as a lens to view the future. And Christians not known to dig deep into the word often poke their nose in this account with his figurative language, allowing for the expansion of the imagination. The average American has little regard for history, past tense, but holds what might occur tomorrow, future tense, with curiosity. Pop culture gives a listening ear to the 16th century French seer Nostradamus, the Bulgarian mystic, Baba Vanda, and the clairvoyant Edgar Cayce. Supposedly, Nostradamus forecast COVID-19, the coronation of Charles to the British throne, and the outcome of the November presidential election. Of the 27 books of the New Testament, casual inquirers are more than likely to check out the back of the holy book. And what deductions have been made about chapters 8 and 9? Terrifying flying creatures with faces like men, long hair of a woman, and tales of scorpions are released from the abyss and permitted to torment, not kill, for a period of five months, unregenerate mankind. Inquiring minds asked, could this swarm of locusts be the cross-breeding of animals, the product of a scientific laboratory with a limited lifespan, initiating a global lockdown? Or could this be the description of a modern mechanical warfare weapon, helicopters with machine guns or drone missiles? If you Google the question, how many people lived in the world 2,000 years ago, it is projected that upwards to 200 million people were scattered on the planet. John tells us that a 200 million man army from the east crossed the Euphrates River, marching toward Jerusalem. The Euphrates is located in Iraq. And there are only two countries, China and India, capable of amassing a military force of this size. Is this an oracle of World War III? For years, the late Ray Brubaker hosted a weekly TV program entitled God's News Behind the News. And Brubaker took headlines from home and abroad and tied them to biblical prophecies. The evangelist said that all Christians should have a Bible in one hand and a newspaper in the others. And the most important furnishings in this chapel is the open Bible on the Lord's table. The Bible is not a closed book. It is open for discussion, for new discoveries and fresh understanding. The Bible is not the book of the dead. It is the living word speaking life to us. It is hoped that after an explanation of revelation, one will find his fingers doing the walking through the other parts of the word of God. The spotlight of the world stage right now is on Israel. For 1900 years, Jews were a dispersed people removed from the promised land. The 14th of May, 1948, Jewish freedom fighters resisting British occupation declared the state of Israel to be a free and dependent country. Eleven minutes later, President Harry Truman went on record, the first government to recognize the legitimacy and right to existence of Israel. Truman had been raised a Baptist, 
later joined the Presbyterian and married an Episcopalian. He shared that in his religious formation that he was instructed with a heavy dosage of revelation charts and graphs and pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-tribulation rapture teaching. And he was much aware that the chosen people would one day return to their ancestral homeland and that divine providence put him in office to help make this prophecy come to pass. Revelation is a lens into the future, and may his Holy Spirit inspiration influence our thoughts and actions. Third and last, the unleashing of God's holy wrath upon evildoers and their entrenched rebellion and unrepentant mindset should fashion within us a need for a rightful fear of the Lord and the consequences to an individual, a group, or a society, which lacks a healthy reference for him, for the way we live, endeavoring to respect him, obey him, and submitting to him. A little girl was on the floor at the feet of her grandmother, preoccupied with a box of crayons, pencils, and paper, engaging in artistic expression. Sweetheart, what are you making? I'm drawing a picture of God. Honey, nobody knows what God looks like. Well, they will when I'm done. The 18th century French philosopher Voltaire penned, In the beginning, God created us in his own image, and we have returned to him the favor. Theologian extraordinaire R.C. Sproul reminds us a God who is all love, all grace, all mercy, no sovereignty, no justice, no holiness, and no wrath, is an idol. Both inside and outside church world, the prevailing view is to focus on the love of God and the tone, tone down or even nullify his righteous indignation and holy anger. This is why there is a campaign by revisionists who say that the Christian religion must reinvent itself to associate with contemporary people. If the majority do not believe that Christ shall come to judge the living and the dead, why say it? The pervasive idea is that all of us are basically good. And if we exhibit any defects, it can be handled by proper education and more federal spending. Reinhold Niebuhr gave us the prayer of serenity. His brother Richard supplied us with a famous appraisal of what we are confronting, familiar to nearly every pastor. A God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through the ministrations of a Christ without a cross. With little or no fear of God and an accountability to him, crime and corruption, perversion and decadence, and wickedness and injustice become our new normals. There is an inability or an unwillingness to think that God is going to do anything about this. And will he allow this rejection to go on indefinitely? The Lord God Almighty has numerous strategies to impose discipline on a person or a people who ignore him. And he has an arsenal of weapons of mass destruction to use if necessary. And that is what we are being told in Revelation. The first government to identify itself as atheistic was the Soviet Union. Kremlin leadership learned that its policy did not make much, much inroads with its peoples. The 26th of April of 1986 witnessed the Nuclear catastrophe, Chernobyl. 
the atomic plant disaster created radiation sickness, birth deformities, and long-term health problems, plus contaminated millions of acres of forest and farmland. Instantly, the men and women of faith in Russia connected the crisis with Revelation 8. A star fell named Wormwood, making the waters bitter with a high death toll. If we had a Russian Bible, Wormwood is rendered Chernobyl. Russians believe that the Lord God brought this Chernobyl affliction upon them because of their decades of unbelief and opposition to him. Commentators agree that Chernobyl and the rise of faith were factors in the collapse of the Iron Curtain. Eighteen months after Chernobyl, Christmas Day, 1988, Gorbachev declared the dissolution of the USSR. Here is an example where the wrath of God served as a deterrent to crime. Revelation is underscoring that the ungodly and the disobedient may force the Lord to pull out all the stops, to knock us down, to get our attention. Will he get our attention? No one is exempt from the chastisements of the Lord. Chapter 9 ends with a summary that the survivors of the plagues continue in their idolatries, murders, witchcraft, fornications, and thievery, and the mess in which we now find ourselves. Do you perceive that more people are drawing closer to the Lord and walking in his ways, or are we moving in the opposite direction? Satan called a convention of demons together for a last-ditch stand to mislead mankind on the path to destruction. And the devils were permitted to share their schemes. One sought to circulate, there is no God. A second added, disseminate the rumor, there is no heaven and hell. But the third proposal won endorsement. Let us try to convince everybody that there is no hurry to get right with God. For the time is at hand. Let us not put off from examining our ways and returning to Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
hearts, my strength over down. And my heart is broken, my heart goes in and out. And each step I take leads me to be high. The mirage of redemption lives on. Changing my soul, giving you my loss. So I want a girl with streams of water tumbling there. A cleansing flow, a happy, happy set. Now I 